Hello, everybody. Kirk Spano, Investing 2020s in various places around the web and Blue Mound Asset Management, a registered investment advisor in Wisconsin. Nothing I say today is individual advice. And I thought I'd cover that just one time. Uh, normally, you have to read the disclaimers to get that. But when I give advice on a stock, it's generic. I don't know if it applies to your particular situation. So if you want individual advice, you need to hire somebody, whether it's me or somebody else. I'm giving you investment ideas. I'm basically telling you the things that I invest in, uh, into the types of accounts that I invest them into. And then if you're a do-it-yourself investor, you'll have to figure out the rest for yourself. I brought that up because Seeking Alpha reminded me that there is no giving individual advice on their website. And I don't know that I really ever talk about that. So I just wanted to bring it up. Make sure I'm on the right side of Seeking Alpha, the regulators, the thought police, the aliens, and whoever else might care. Now, this week... I did a couple of webinars already, and I'm starting to put them onto uh, Buzzsprout, which is a podcasting host. So if you like to listen in your car or something along those lines and just want to use your phone to listen uh, versus looking at the handful of charts that I toss up from time to time, you can go ahead and do that through the podcast. And I'm going to start including uh, more chart books. And they'll be small, four, five, six, seven, eight maybe 10 pages, but you'll be able to get them on your investment letter site of choice so that you don't have to always watch and listen at the same time. So this is Investing 2020s with Kirk Spano, same name as YouTube, over at Buzzsprout. And yesterday, I interviewed CEO Peter Platzer, and normally I'd fuddy-duddy around and not get these posted for a few days. However... I stayed up late. I am taking a nap after this webinar. And I posted the interview with Peter Plaster. So I hope a few of you have already listened to it or watched it. Uh, I just got it on Buzzsprout, so I know that nobody's downloaded it yet. But would love for you guys to put that app on your phone. And you can keep track of these and you know listen to them once in a while. I will say the interview with the CEO of Spire Global... Peter Platzer, I thought was very, very good. And I asked him a couple of hard questions. Uh, one in particular, I wanted him to talk to us about Spire Global's experience and his experience with SPACs. And he was very circumspect, you know, closed it out with, wish he hadn't done it, wish he had just IPO'd like they were planning to do, but such is life. And I made the point that I have never seen so many micro and small cap stocks just screaming to be bought my whole career. And I've been a micro cap and small cap investor since the late 1990s. I think, and I've told you this before, I think that if you're not buying micro caps and small caps right now, then you are missing the boat. I think once liquidity starts to loosen up, and it will in the next year, you're going to wish, you're really going to wish that you had a lot more growth in your portfolio. Because as interest rates come down, these stocks are going to scream like they always do. And, by the way, dividend stocks will get a rally too. So there's almost nothing that's not going to benefit from the Fed discontinuing rate hikes sometime this year and then cutting the quantitative tightening sometime next year because both things are going to happen. Right now, this stock market is jittery because, one, it's extremely low volume because you're all on vacation. And you should be on vacation. I'm going on vacation next Tuesday, which means the market's going to drop. You should be fishing or golfing or playing with grandkids or going to a museum or catching up on five seasons of Yellowstone like I did or something else. This is a very difficult market to trade. Unless you have a stock like Spire Global or Metis or some other small or micro cap that has catalysts hitting this fall, I don't think there's much to do. I will tell you, the dip in Bitcoin today is super interesting to me. I think that there's a lot of fear starting to get priced into the market. And my guess is that the market bottoms out either just before the Fed meeting or about a month after. We'll see what the Federal Reserve does in September. Virtually every single 
economic indicator suggests that they should hold the line. They should neither raise nor cut interest rates. And I'm going to write an article before I leave next week. I'm not sure which one I'll publish. It's either going to be if Powell kills labor, he kills everything, or it's going to be that wage inflation is good. But those will be the next two macro dashes. It'll be a one-two punch. I really want you to think about what the economy looks like if we start to see disinflation, which we have almost everywhere, turn into outright deflation in certain things, in particular, energy and healthcare. I put out the article on Teladoc this week talking about deflation and healthcare. Normally, an article with the word deflation in it and saying something that is not mainstream, like we're going to get healthcare deflation, would get 30,000 views minimum up to a couple hundred thousand. This article's got about 9,000 so far in four days. Nobody's interested in stocks right now. They're, everybody's vacationing. They're all ignoring the short-term volatility. Now, that means that shorts, if they have the cash to do it, can be pretty powerful for a few weeks and really up to a month or two. And that's why I expect the market to bottom sometime in the next month or two. This area right in here, from here to here, from about 4,000 on SPY to about 3,600 on SPY, on the SP 500, that is, seems like pretty strong support all of a sudden, unless Jerome Powell wants it to go lower than that range. If Powell really wants to see a big correction, he will talk really tough at the next Fed meeting and raise interest rates. I don't think it's necessary because the economy is already showing that it's stabilizing rather than racing, that the only real inflation is in wages, and that's come down a lot. Big reset in wages pretty much happened. There's going to be some pulling. Amazon's going to get teamstered. But for the most part, everybody's gotten their wage increase. They weren't small. People making 12 started making 15. People making 15 started making 20. People making 20 started making 20-something. And that's really where that inflation was needed. It's happened now. Businesses have adjusted. And with the advent of AI, which is just surging in use, just surging in use, I don't think you're going to see as strong wage inflation going forward, with a possible exception of some labor jobs. I don't think the auto workers got exactly what they wanted last time, and they certainly won't get what they want next time. The negotiations with the UAW for everyone over the next few years are going to focus on people keeping their jobs more than anything as EVs hit the market. Like I told you, Ford and GM are going to become conglomerates because they have both the technology and the freed up real estate space to do it. Somebody was talking down Ford the other day on Seeking Alpha and in the cable TV realm, CNBC realm. And I'll tell you what, they really just don't know what they're talking about. I'm not sure where they get their information, to be honest, sometimes. The CEOs are telling you exactly what they're spending money on. Just follow the money. And the only thing you can come up with is that everything is stabilizing right now and that the future is greener and more high tech in particular using AI. And if this stock market decides to sell off in the next month or two, it'll mainly be the large cap stocks. Because again, the small and micro cap stocks are already beat the heck. Maybe they take their 30 or 40 or 50% retraces of the rallies that they've had lately. And you'll get your last chance to buy. I think that as soon as the market realizes the financial conditions aren't going to get tighter much longer, and they can't, they really can't. Not without destroying the economy. I think enough people at the Fed know that. Pay attention to Austin Goolsby. He's probably the smartest guy in the room at the Fed. Remember, Powell's not an economist. He just takes advice. The knucklehead from St. Louis finally got retired. Never thought he was good at his job. Been ripping on him for years for the dumb things that he said. And yet they kept going to him. Wrong, 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 wrong. Over and over and over again. But he kept getting on CNBC. I don't handle production for them. So all I can really tell you is that if you are prone to panicking, just turn your zucking computer off and cancel the alerts and the notifications you get on your phone for the next few weeks. Because it could be scary. And that's what we've been hoping for. One last chance for an easy money purchase 
with some great companies, followed by a rally and everything. When you take a look on the forward price to earnings ratios, price to earnings to growth ratios, a lot of them have come back in. We've talked about that for years. We've had a combination of earnings going up, margins getting a little bit better, which will continue with AI, growth year companies getting into the S&P 500 finally, slow growth or no growth companies with debt falling out. And that'll really start to happen in 2026 because a lot of those companies are going to have a very hard time refinancing in 24 and 25. They will get worse terms. And there will be dividend cuts for the companies that don't have the growth to offset the higher interest rates. So while I do think interest rates will come down in the next year, I don't think it's going to be so dramatic as what we saw post-COVID or post-financial crisis or anything like that. We're not going to get zero interest rates for a pretty long time. Remember, the Fed's up over five now at five and a half. It might end up at five and three quarters or even six. If they get to six, they're trying to cause a recession. They're not trying to do the soft landing anymore. Right now, we really are on pace for a soft landing. This is, in my lifetime, the best economy I can remember. Now, I don't really remember the 70s, and I certainly wasn't around for the 60s and 50s. But this is a healthier, better economy than we had in the 90s or pre-financial crisis. There's a lot of cash on certain corporate balance sheets. You take a look at Spire Global. They have cash on their balance sheet, and they're about to turn profitable for a small cap. Ametis has about $150 million extra dollars coming over the next year because of the tax breaks. You already know what the NASDAQ stocks have on their balance sheets, and another 100 or so on the S P 500 have accumulated cash too. Granted, there's still a couple hundred on the S P 500 that I don't want to own, but if you buy Berkshire Hathaway or the Invesco GARP fund, you can beat the S&P 500 just by getting rid of some of the shit stocks. Pick your time frame. When you take a look at this chart, I do want you to pay attention to this period again. I have talked on and off with you about the time period from 2014, 2016, this sideways period, two years. Well, here we are, January of 21, and maybe sometime this year we test that area again. Almost two years. It maybe gets down to here. But two years allowed the market to heal itself. Overvaluations have started to go away in most companies. Only a few that are obnoxiously overpriced anymore. And if you take a look at just the last five years, you see we had essentially a sideways period here too. After a step up of two years, we had the rally after the crash. Lasted about a year and a half. Could go down, up and down. Again, you find another one of those roughly two-year periods before you get another step up. So I wouldn't be too worried about the volatility. That 20 or 25% you have in cash that a lot of you have, you can just finally buy large caps again. Unless that's mainly what you've owned, in which case you may want to do just a little bit of trimming for the next couple of months. Or you can do what often makes sense and just do nothing. Let time smooth out the wiggles in the chart. The idea that the U.S. is going to have a debt problem, has come up, oh, every few years my entire career, and it has always been wrong. People don't understand how big numbers work because they're hard to understand. But again, I will bring out my example of a mortgage on a house. The value of the assets in the United States are somewhere between 10 and 15 times, 10 and 15 times the size of the annual economy. If you're a real estate investor, you'll understand where those numbers kind of come from. You're always told if you're going to buy a piece of real estate that it should pay for itself in under 10 years. When you start thinking about the value of the assets in this country, and then you think about the current debt, you should really only ask yourself this conceptual question. If my house was worth a million dollars and I had a $100,000 mortgage, would I be worried too much about it? Pretty easy answer, right? The equity in this country dwarfs, just completely blows away the debt. We already know that the Federal Reserve can buy trillions of dollars of debt whenever it feels like it and put it onto a long-term mortgage to get through any demographic issues. Japan's been doing it for almost two generations and they haven't had a problem. The United States economy is way better than the Japanese economy. Way better. Better demographics, more resources, better military, all sorts of things. The banks don't need to buy U.S. treasuries if the system, 
Federal Reserve and the FDIC are telling them, hold bigger reserves. No. The smart banks didn't screw up their lending two years ago. They continued to use short-term lending versus then stretching out their balance sheets to hold longer-term debt. And the, the smart banks will now shift over the next year to buy longer-term debt. Because as interest rates come down, and they will, they make money on that trade. All they have to do is manage to knock it upside down for the next year, and they're fine. So the idea that there's going to be a debt crisis, meh, it'll last a week. Is that really a crisis, or is that a hiccup? I've talked about this stuff over and over again. If you've listened to me for a long time, you know it, and you know that I've been pretty close to right for a very long time, since 2012. That's a pretty long time. The dollar is going to continue to be the strongest currency platform on the planet for the rest of all of your lives. There will not be an epic collapse in the dollar. There never has been. We should tell you that there are so many good reasons for it not to have happened that they haven't changed overnight. The incremental increases in debt that are largely tied to aging demographics will naturally just play their course as aging demographics go from being a curve to being a flat line again. And that's what we'll see over the next decade. And that's why the dollar will get stronger. It will have to find ways to keep it weaker. Somebody asked if I had a response to the people who say that there's going to be a dollar crisis and a debt crisis because they go hand in hand. That's my response. Those folks are wrong. The people who have been saying that the last 20 or 30 years have been wrong. They will continue to be wrong. And the people who start buying into that in their older age are just having natural responses to new things, especially in older age. And I don't mean to be an ageist. However, as folks get older, their mental flexibility changes, not for the better. It is something that you should work on on a daily basis because if you don't, your thinking can get frozen. I've seen it around me. I've seen it in a lot of places. I've read it everywhere. It is actually a task that I focus on very regularly. How to remain open-minded. How to not fall for fear. The world's been getting better since the dark ages. And if you just think about what AI is opening up for us, if you have any appreciation of Star Trek or some of the better sci-fi out there that's not dystopian. What you should be realizing right now is that we are about to see another generational boom led by the millennials and AI and all the other fourth industrial revolution technologies that are going to, over the next couple of generations, tame climate change and require us to work less while still making the same kind of money. Which is why I say wage inflation is good. Going back to the U.S. debt thing. When the short-term rates get back down to 2 or 3%, that means that the U.S. government can finance things for a couple of years cheap. Saw the 30-year interest rate pushed 7% the other day. If you're happy with a 7% rate of return, you ought to be buying 30-year treasuries. They ain't going to be 7% in seven years. It'll be back down to 4 or 5 so not only will you get an appreciation in principal, but you'll still be collecting that 7%. There is a inflation protected bond out there, a long-term one. I forget which one it is. Take a look at that. If you're happy with middle single-digit interest rates that come with a government guarantee and are likely to appreciate a little bit for you. That's not what I focus on here. I don't focus on bonds, but uh, you know sometimes they make some sense. Dollar's going to come down a little bit as they start lowering the interest rates. You just have to play through these little cycles. But look at that chart to the 70s. What makes anybody think the dollar is going to collapse and that we're going to have a debt crisis? Quantitative easing works, period. So every single pullback is a buying opportunity. Now, the pullbacks can be bigger sometimes, which is why you look at the monthly charts, not the daily charts. And understand the politics involved. And remember to overlay... The negotiations are going to have through the end of the year on the budget. If the Democrats are smart, and typically they are, they will work out a budget freeze for the next couple of years with the Republicans. The problem is that you have only about 20 Republicans in the House that will agree to things that are sensible. The rest of them want to cut Social Security and Medicare. And I've been talking to you about for months, Social Security, I've been talking about Social Security forever. Social Security is not a problem. 
Anybody who thinks it is just doesn't understand it, period. They don't understand it. Social Security is fully funded for another decade and mostly funded through the end of the century. There are incredibly tiny tweaks that need to be made to it with regard to retirement ages and things like that. Minor. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense that full retirement age for most people is between 65 and now 67, when life expectancy has increased by, what is it, 17 or 18 years since the 70s? And I'm not saying that we should retire 17 years later, but two is a little silly. There should be a graduated retirement scale. You can be able to retire anywhere between 60 and 70, depending on what kind of work you did, and if you're willing to take a haircut. Other governments have that. There's no reason why we can't. If you were carrying around concrete for a living, maybe your retirement age is 60. If you're a professor or a banker, or somebody who sits behind a computer, made six figures, maybe your retirement age is 70 to get your full Social Security benefit. It doesn't have to be that hard. Social Security is a pretty easy fix. Medicare was the one that scared me for the last couple of decades. And what I have seen with AI in the last three or four years is mind-bogglingly good. You are going to see deflation in healthcare, period. Again, period. As an investor, our job is to figure out who's going to make money on that and who's going to run in place. The United Healthcare runs in place because their revenues will stop going up, but their margins will expand a little bit. Teladoc, starting from small numbers, but already deeply entrenched with half of the Fortune 500 companies, is the one that has a lot of room to run. And the reason those disparities happen is because people look backwards when they invest instead of forwards. Four out of five people. When you see shorts on a message board or something like that, we're talking about, oh, this company has a big accumulated debt, so we're shorting it. They're playing on the fact that people have a hard time looking forward or with curves. Most people look backwards in a linear fashion. And that's why I can kick most people's ass at investing. So I work really hard to look forward and look for the curves. So pretty much, now that you've been on this call or heard this webinar, stop zucking asking about a debt crisis or a dollar collapse or the end of the dollar or the United States is zucked because of this, that, or the other thing. The United States, even if we have to use some Japanese policies for a while, is going to continue to grow. Reshoring is good for us. Immigration, when we get around to it, will be good for us. But that's not a problem because we have 10 times more assets, at least 10 times more assets, than we do debt. And trimming a trillion dollars off the federal budget isn't really a big deal, especially if there's deflation in healthcare, which we know. At this point, we know. If you're arguing that we don't know that there's healthcare deflation coming, and again, you haven't read a McKinsey report. You haven't been listening to me. You've been listening to some schmuck on the internet who doesn't know shit from Shine. Or on the south side of Milwaukee, Shinola. We shorten it on the north side. You want to be invested in American companies. And though it will require more trading every few years, emerging market. Because still a couple billion people, four million, four billion people really, about four billion, need to have big jumps in standard of living. And most of the rest, with the exception of your one and two percenters, are going to live better too. There will be no end of consumerism. It will just change. There will be more travel. As more and more people see the world, some of the stupid right-wing stuff that's out there will disappear or at least get watered down again. It took 80 years for it to come back, or 60 years. It took 60 years for it to come back, as strong as it has in the last decade. And with less extremism comes more peace. With more rationalization about why cities have had a problem, that'll get fixed, right? Extremism is on both sides, or I should say all sides, because it's not just two. We'll find the middle way. Ah, somebody knows what that is. Why? Because it always works out that way. We haven't blown ourselves up yet. We've had less war in the world this century than the last century. We've had higher standards of living. The technology is just going to keep pushing it that way. And as people have more money, an ability to travel and communicate, the bullshit dissipates. So on this journey, which is scary because it's new, but what's next is always new and always scary, right? That's never different. You're going to have the ability in the next decade to make millions of dollars, even if you're starting with five figures and just contributing your thousand a month or whatever it is to your 401k and Roth IRA. 
If you're already in the six figures, booyah, you'll do better. If you're in the seven figures, you and it doesn't even matter what age. I mean, if you're 90, it might be different. If you're in your 70s or younger and you're already in the seven figures, you should be talking about legacies with your family. And you should be talking to estate planning attorneys and thinking about what you want your money to do for the next two generations. Three generations from now, who knows? But for your grandkids and your great-grandkids, who you probably will meet, think about what you want to do for them. And that's why even in your 70s, you should have a pretty good sleeve of growth stocks. You really only need as much income generation as you need, right? That's the answer to income. If you need $200,000 a year to live because of you're just going to live it up and or, or because of where you live, right? $200,000 in Milwaukee, I'm the king. $200,000 in California, I'm doing all right, you know, but I'm not driving Maseratis. Generate the amount of income you need and the rest should be in growth. That's the way to look at it to me. And that guy in Omaha generally agrees. So I give you this pump up speech in my rah-rah voice because you might need it the next month or two. Take some time off. Don't sit there and watch the numbers. Think about what you own and what you want to own. And I want you to think about how far ahead we have been on certain things. Like this one. I just saw that. I'm telling you the future, folks. I can't give you the perfect forecast of when everything happens. I can tell you what's going to happen. You just got to find your spots to get in at the right price. And have patience when the lines wiggle a little bit on you. Take a look at the small caps. Figure out if your asset allocation is right. If you're a little older, maybe you're above 25% cash. But if you're earning, right, if you have an income, you're pounding money into your 401k, one, you should be looking for ways to increase that to the maximums. You can put 25% of your wages into a 401k. You should do it, or at least work in that direction. I've heard people say, well, the stock market is going down, so I'm going to invest less in my 401k. I generally call them dumb zuckers, and I try to talk them out of it. Then I stop banging my head. Pullbacks are opportunities. Why? Because of that. It's just going to keep going higher. Here's a 10-year period, point to point. This was unusual. Got the rally. Maybe we'll come back to here. Then it'll be off to the races again at some point. And again, the small caps usually lead. But dividends are going to do well this time too, because as in, as government interest rates come down, dividends will look more attractive again. So all you got to do is find the companies that are growing their dividends without growing debt or issuing shares, basically that are profitable, have some growth, get a manageable or getting better balance sheet. Fortress balance sheets are nice, but if you've noticed, most of the companies with Fortress balance sheets don't pay out dividends. Dividends have kind of become a gimmick to get shareholders. And it's not even working at a company like AT&T. Most of the healthiest companies do not pay out big dividends. Learn how to manage your money. Sell some options from time to time. You'll make more income and you'll own better companies, all for learning how to sell options. All right, let's call it a day. I need a nap.